Hello, um, my name is Jennifer Jackson. I'm a registered nurse and I am a doctoral researcher at King's College London. This video is a recording of a lecture that I gave in the fall of 2018 about ethics and sensitive issues in healthcare research. So it was delivered to two nursing students. However, it will be of interest and the content is relevant to anyone um, who is doing research in healthcare. So the objectives for this video are to explain ethics as a concept, be able to identify key ethical principles, and understand how we've come to those principles, what the historical influence has been. Think about what kind of things you need to consider when you're researching sensitive issues, and recognize how ethical issues relate to different types of studies. So what is ethics? Ethics is a little hard to pin down because it is at the level of philosophy and theory. And as we'll see in the next slide, it's not about right or wrong checklist. It's not about what your organization will allow. It's about what is morally the right thing to do and how to proceed doing that in a research context. So for the purposes of accessibility, I'm going to read these definitions. So a general ethics is a general area of rights and wrongs in the theory and practice of human behavior. It is a brand of philosophy which deals with thinking about morality. Ethics is a branch of moral philosophy, the purpose of which is to inquire into the nature of good, bad, right, and wrong in human actions. It is not legal law, hospital etiquette, hospital policy, public opinion, following the orders of superior, or even a mere gut response. So that quote very specifically outlines what ethics is not, which hopefully give, provides a better sense of what it is. And finally, ethics is designed to illuminate what we ought to do by asking us to consider and reconsider our ordinary actions judgments and justifications. So ethics in research is an umbrella over the whole process, much like clinical education. Just as we would not do anything that was unethical in clinical practice, we must similarly not do anything that is unethical in research practice as well. So ethics is the first principle to determine quality when you're examining research. So even if you're not conducting research yourself, it's important to know about research because that is how you evaluate whether something should be applied to practice or not. So if it's not ethical, it's not good research, full stop. This is really important because nursing and other healthcare professions are evidence-based disciplines. So our understanding and what we do in the clinical setting comes from research, or some may argue that it doesn't always, but it generally should. So if it doesn't come from research, there's a question about its value. And there's also a question of if the research that is guiding practice is unethical, what is the knock-on effect of that in clinical practice and ultimately for patients? So ethics is very complex and difficult to navigate. When I initially started nursing, I thought ethics was don't hit your patients, don't sleep with your patients, don't steal from them, and um, don't kill anyone and don't do anything horrible like those nurses you read about in the magazine from the college. Now I have a much more new to understanding of this and recognize that ethics is actually very complex and very difficult to navigate uh, when you're doing studies and generally in clinical practice as well. So what is the role of the researcher? So the responsibility for ethical practice lies with the practitioner, just as the responsibility for good clinical practice lies with the practitioner. And the burden is always with the person who is leading the research, never with the participant. Same as the burden is always with the nurse or the physician and never with the patient. So this reflects the unequal power dynamics that occur between the person who's doing research and the person who's participating. Even in models where they try and kind of level that hierarchy a bit, 
it is still really important to recognize that there is a privilege that comes with being the researcher and that person must take that very seriously because their first duty is to protect participants, not to you know, win a Nobel Prize, not to come out with incredible findings, it is to protect participants. So the obligations for a researcher towards their research participants are as strict as those towards clinical patients. So in terms of confidentiality and duty of candor and all of the factors that come together as you would apply to a patient, you must also apply to a research participant. So research relationships are not therapeutic relationships. It's important to keep that in mind when you're working with participants. Your goal, unless it's part of the stated study, is not to necessarily improve their lives. It is not to improve their health. It is not to counsel them or provide you know, therapeutic engagement per se. Your role is to protect the participant from harm while collecting data to meet the objectives of the study. That is your role. It is not a therapeutic relationship. And I've seen nurses who run into trouble with this when their patient may, or excuse me, their participant may bring up some difficult experiences and they approach that as though it's counseling rather than an interview, for example. So it's something you need to be very aware of and always be reflecting and saying, am I, maintaining these boundaries appropriately and where is the line and um, how do I protect the participants and make sure that the burden for the research is with me and not them. So research is very strict. Why? Because there has been a legacy of bad research and if you ever need a horribly depressing Wikipedia spiral, I suggest you look up any of the studies I've listed here. So I'm just going to go over them and breathe because these are some of the most known examples of unethical research and they have had a profound impact on how we conduct research today. So the Tuskegee syphilis study was conducted in the U.S. with um, black people who had syphilis. So the purpose of the study was to look and see if the, pro the progression of syphilis in a black person was the same as in a white person. So this was influenced by very um, racist ideas right out the gate. The biggest problem with this study was the fact that during the course of the study, penicillin became available, which is a cure and an effective treatment for syphilis. However, the researchers wanted to see what the conclusion of syphilis would be for these patients, so they did not offer them the cure. They were purposely not given treatment for their illness, even though it had become treatable, to see what it would be like for them to die of syphilis and how that compared to white people who had died of syphilis. So um, that was an absolutely horrible example, and it ended up where there was grave harm to patients and their families as well. The Stanford Prison Experiment was um, also conducted in the U.S., and this was where um, the researcher recruited young men, um, university students, to come during the summer and they were going to create a mock prison. So half of the students were randomly assigned to be prisoners and half of the students were assigned to be prison guards. So the students that were prisoners, they were put in cells, um, they were given you know, prison clothing, Whereas the people who were the prison guards were given um, reflective glasses and uniforms and things that kind of gave them a bit of a power differential over the people who were prisoners. And so the study started kind of innocently enough, but ultimately was stopped early because it escalated wildly out of control to the point where the prison guards were almost torturing the 
people who were the prisoners. And it was amazing that the study escalated that quickly. So the Stanford prison experiment ultimately was unethical in that um, the way it had unfolded. The researchers did stop it and have since been very frank about their experiences and that kind of thing, and that they almost were caught up in it themselves and didn't realize exactly how distorted it had become because they were immersed in it. So there was a lot of disclosure and, you know, kind of follow up of things with this. And we did learn a lot about an ugly side of humanity, but ultimately it was research that should not have been conducted in that way. Similarly, Milgram's obedience experiments were ones where Milgram brought, he wanted to understand more about why people had followed Nazi orders and harmed their neighbors, their friends, and, you know, for example, people in concentration camps. So he wanted to understand this more. So he brought participants in and had a researcher in a white lab coat who was a Confederate tell them to administer shocks to supposed um, partic other participants. So they had to push buttons on a machine. It was very purposeful. They had to do that to supposedly administer electric shocks. Um, they were not administering shocks and they were not harming anyone, but they thought they were. And there was a person on the other side of the wall who would yell and bang on the wall and that type of thing. And every person who was in the experiment administered at least, um, I think it was 150 volts of electric shock. So people kind of wanted to stand back and say, I would never do that. I would never act that way. But Milgram found when you had the influence of an authority figure, people did act in a way that they would believe that they were harming others. So again, this is a study that showed us a lot about an ugly side of humanity and was knowledge that we might not necessarily have acquired otherwise. But at the same time, this was very unethical research and uh, was cause for grave concern. Finally, uh, Mengel's experiments at Auschwitz, I will just talk about very briefly because they're truly disturbed. Um, but he conducted all kinds of experiments on um, people, especially twins and tried to do things that had absolutely no merit to science and were just extremely sick and perverse. So like trying to change people's eye colors um, and all, you know, all kinds of things. So if you want to know more about it, I suggest you look it up, but it's, it's very disturbing. And um, the experiments at Auschwitz were probably the worst uh, not that we want to have a race to the bottom, but they were probably the worst research that has ever been conducted. I don't think you could even call it research. I mean, it was perhaps under the guise of, of scientific experimentation, but it was basically just torture. So these are really glaring examples and they show you what happens when things go drastically wrong. But there are also lots more of subtle violations that it doesn't have to be this bad to still be a problem. The other thing to say is these were all experiments that were done, um, I would say pre-1980, but that doesn't mean that bad research is a relic of the past. There is still unethical research that happens today. And um, I think the classic example of that is uh, Wakefield, and the vaccination studies, that was unethical research that was published and has caused how many deaths and just huge amounts of harm. And so for that reason, we can't say that we've completely learned to move forward. Ethics and research is as relevant today as, as it ever has been. So in response to the experiments conducted by Mengel and others, um, the Nuremberg Code established basic standards that covered moral and ethical legal obligations for medical research and medical practice. These um, 
have been made more sophisticated now, but they still form the basis of everything that is used in currently. The focus here was on informed consent. People must know what is happening to them. They must know what their options are and that they can leave the study. And they must be fully aware of what the benefits or risks the research might present. So to this day, informed consent is one of the um, most important aspects of research, especially in research ethics, and is something that is of paramount concern for all healthcare research. Now, the Declaration of Helsinki was developed in 1964 and is a policy statement for the World Medical Association and forms the basis of basically all of the local policies around ethics. So what the British Medical Association and others, what their statements would be. Um, this, you can find a version online if you just Google it, that is uh, four pages and kind of an infographic style. It's very quick read. And I suggest you have a look because it is a fantastic summary of ethical principles and how they're applied in practice. So this sets out the standards for medical research involving human subjects. Ethics also applies if you're doing research that is, for example, you in some kind of petri dish or using animal models or, you know, just because humans aren't necessarily involved doesn't mean ethics don't apply, but there's different standards. And so this focuses on research involving humans. So you may be tempted to say, so what are the rules for doing good research, doing ethical research? Um, there's lots of rules. There's lots of different codes and guidelines, and it's up to you to know which ones are appropriate for the research you are doing. So there are a few like the Declaration of Helsinki that are very broad in general. There's others that are very specific to say biomedical research or um, social science types of ethnographic observations and different things like that. So depending on kind of the brand of research you're using, then you can get different standards that are more specifically applied. So there's tons and tons of free standards out there. It's very easy to find them. And the responsibility is up to you to find the one that applies and make sure you follow that guidance. So slightly changing um, our topic here, we're talking about ethics as a concept. And this can help you to think about different ethical ways of considering problems and the kind of language you can use to express different perspectives on the same issues. So consequentialism, or also called utilitarianism, is the idea that the end justifies the means. So the end goal is the most important thing. Deontology, in contrast, is the idea that the means are the most important. So essentially that the end doesn't necessarily justify the means, that you have to look at how something is achieved rather than what is achieved. So to look at what these look like in practical examples, um, you may be doing a study where you need to take blood tests from someone. And um, once you get blood tests from the participants, you're going to look at their markers for different heart conditions. Well, statistically, two people die every year in the UK from phlebotomy. They can risk getting um, different kinds of infection from flora on the skin and, and statistically people can die from it. However, you can also say that the risk of someone dying because of um, having a blood test done is so small and the potential benefit of developing new treatments for heart conditions is so great that here we're going to have a utilitarian approach that the ends justify the means. So we accept the risk that comes from having a blood test in order to complete this research project. In contrast, you might have a deontological standpoint if you would say, you know what, we're testing a new drug and it has the potential to cure this type of cancer. It worked in animal models. There's lots of 
excitement here about what could happen with humans. However, the people who are taking it are extremely nauseous and extremely fatigued. They can't get out of bed. They have no quality of life and it is not worth doing. It is not worth continuing with this because it is causing so much distress for the participants that, you know, if it cures cancer, it'll be at too high a cost. Um, so in that case, you would say the means are more important. The how is more important. We can't make people who are already suffering gravely ill in the hopes that they may end up with a cure, but we don't have any guarantee of that. So that's how you can apply these different concepts depending on the issues you're considering within your project. Reflecting on other key ethical principles, we can look and say beneficence is the idea that something must do good. It has to have some type of benefit for someone, otherwise we're not doing it. Non-maleficence is the principle of protecting participants or patients and saying to do no harm. Now, like everything with ethics, there can be some gray areas here. The individual participant might not benefit. They might kind of come out of it neutral with no benefit to themselves, but perhaps there is a greater benefit to society. Or there might be a very small or measured amount of harm, such as reliving a traumatic experience or potentially having an uncomfortable procedure, but also, there may be benefit in the long run. There also may not. So it's important to weigh these things up because it's not black and white as to yes, this does good, uh, no, this does no harm. Autonomy is the right to self-determination, respect, dignity, and informed consent so that you always treat people with the highest possible standard and affirm their humanity and they're never treated as, as participants that, um, that you're not concerned about their well-being. Also, you have justice, the right to fair treatment, the right to privacy and confidentiality and uphold the upholding of fairness. So this is to say that if a study is found to be very beneficial and say half the people in the study are receiving the treatment, that treatment then must be offered to the other half as well. Or you know, if there are undue risks for some participants, other participants who may face those risks must be made aware. So these are key principles you can use when considering different aspects of the study and kind of what is more important. And so I'll unpack some examples of these as we go further. So when it comes to ethics, it's important to be aware of your own stance and kind of which of these principles you place the greatest emphasis on because other people will feel differently and they may place greater emphasis on other things. And so you need to be able to understand where you're coming from and where they're coming from so that you can figure out ways to ensure that research is acceptable and appropriate. There's sometimes more than one right answer and having said that there's no clear right or wrong these things can be really messy. However, research institutions like universities, hospitals, they all have ethics boards and ethics committees, and they are available specifically to help deal with the issues when you're not sure how to proceed. So some essential ingredients for ethical research. The research must be necessary. It has to be something that's actually going to be of value and contribute to humanity and to healthcare in one way or another. For example, you could do studies that might be kind of fun and you get to like invade people's privacy a bit and you know there might be sort of a voyeur aspect that you might find interesting, but if it's not actually going to be useful, then it's not good research. The other thing is you could have studies that are telling us the same thing over and over and over again. Um, if you're doing a study to assess how much nausea is present in patients receiving chemotherapy, that's not necessary. Like we already know that people experience a lot of nausea. If you're just doing a prevalence to count how many people that is, that wouldn't be something that would necessarily contribute to healthcare. So the research needs to be needed. The participants must receive a full explanation of their involvement. 
Now, there are exceptions to this because sometimes um, you can have what's called the Hawthorne effect, which is where people change their behavior on the basis of knowing that they're being observed. So if you want to see someone in their kind of natural environment or with their normal behavior, you might not tell them you're watching them. The other thing could be considering if you are looking at crowds or large groups. For example, you might not stand in the middle of, you know, Oxford Circus or Times Square with a megaphone and say, I'm observing your health behaviors and you're eating right now, so act normal. <laughs> you can't do something like that. So there may be things where you do an observation and then seek consent after the fact or ask the participant if they want to participate after the fact. Or you may, if you're doing something, um, you know, getting survey responses from an auditorium or something, you might put a sign on the door saying, um, if you enter, your information will be used in this way and you have the right not to enter. But, you know, once you're here, we'll be doing observations, that type of thing. So generally, if you don't tell a participant all about the study before you collect data, you must do so after. So you must follow up with people and say, you know, I observed your practice today. This is the study. Um, I'm wondering if it's OK that I include your data. They may say no, in which case you have to remove all of it. Another option is you might tell people like there might be some deception. So you might tell them you're studying healthy eating, but actually you're considering something slightly different. You're looking at perhaps family dynamics during meal times and you know how that relates to attachment styles. So then somebody knows that they're being watched. They know that they're participating in research, but you maybe don't necessarily tell them exactly what you're looking for. And again, this will be one that at the end, you must go back and tell them all everything and make sure it's still OK with them to participate. So depending on the type of research you're doing, sometimes there could be gray areas that it is acceptable to get around, but you would want to be working with a senior person who has experience doing that because it's something that would have to be done very, very carefully. Um, so you must have consent. Most of the times a person must sign a consent form. There can be cases of if you proceed with the survey online, for example, that signals that you have consented to the study. But one way or another, you must have consent and you must maintain confidentiality. So generally, when you do research studies, there is no medical records department like you are medical records. So it is important that you are maintaining all of the paperwork. It's not just getting stacked in file folders. You have to be meticulous and very, very detailed about how you keep records of everything and everyone in the study so that nothing is being lost or misused. So further ingredients. The researcher must be trained and qualified in the appropriate method. The person doing the research has to know what they're doing. Just as you would not send someone who's not trained in to um, do a patient's leg dressing, you would not have someone who doesn't know about the method to go in and to do research. So you might have somebody say, oh, I'm just going to go talk to people at the homeless shelter and, you know, just um, chat with them about different things like, well, have you practiced interview technique? Do you have an interview guide? Have you thought about how you're going to troubleshoot different issues? This is a vulnerable population. How are you going to approach that? So it's something that sometimes people think, oh, you just talk to someone or, oh, you just give them a survey. But the researcher must be qualified in order to do what they're doing. Participants must be protected. That is one of the foremost points for any researcher. And I have here protected from pain, harm, suffering and injury. There can be slight degrees of discomfort that are acceptable. For example, if someone's receiving um, a blood test, that does hurt. Um, that's not neutral. But then at the same time, that is considered in the context of the whole study as being a reasonable, can be considered a reasonable risk. So you must determine that if someone does experience a small amount of pain or suffering or something like that, um, that that is reasonable and the participant is aware that that is going to happen. 
The other thing is studies have often been stopped if it seems that harm is being caused to patients. So if someone is trialing a new type of medication and patients are not tolerating it, that counts as harm. And so um, in some cases, studies are stopped because it's not ethical to proceed. The relationship between the sponsor of the researcher, research, excuse me, and the researcher must be made clear. And you would think, yes, that's obvious, but there have been studies, for example, there was a, a blood replacement um, type of pla synthetic plasma that was being used with patients. And then it was found out that the person who had done the vast majority of the research on using that type of synthetic plasma was paid by the plasma company. So that is a clear <laughs> breach. And you must clearly say who paid for the research and who, what organizations endorse the research and what are you doing? That must be made clear throughout. Also, ethics is not something you can just tick a box that it's done, you filled out the form, and now you can move forward. Ethical issues are something that must be reviewed throughout studies, and you have to consider it all the way along. Further to that end, um, here I'll provide some examples of different types of issues that come up. So when you're thinking about planning a study, you need to make sure a study is feasible, that you can actually do it, that you can actually get the information that you need, that you have you have considered as much as possible in terms of where are you going to store the information, how long are you going to keep it, how are you going to make sure that the participants are not having undue burden, what happens if something goes wrong, what happens if a participant is harmed, what support can you offer participants after participating? There's all kinds of things. So you must make sure that you are very thorough in planning. Now there's ultimately always something that comes up in a study that you didn't think about that just you know, catches you by surprise. However, you should have enough in place that it's something that you can deal with or at least you know who to approach to address those issues. So in terms of approvals and funding, um, this is very challenging because funding is extremely competitive and people may try to inflate the importance of their study or uh, take an inappropriate slant on pilot work to try and make um, them a more suitable candidate for funding. Uh, people might skip over parts in terms of their approvals and that kind of thing. So it's very important that you're really thorough and you're honest about what you hope to achieve to the funder and that you demonstrate you have good plans to get there. When you're recruiting participants, you need to make sure that you have ethically recruited them. There can be a tendency, I think with nurses, we're very good at coaxing people to take medication sometimes not necessarily you know if they are refusing a medication but if they're oh i don't know if i want to take that today we can kind of coax them into it if you're recruiting research participants you cannot do that you cannot coax them you have to be honest with them about the benefits and risks of participation and if they say no you have to leave it at that. Now, if you are one participant away from finishing your PhD and you're running out of time and you're running out of money, that can be a really difficult thing to do. If you're under a lot of pressure, it's hard, but it is very important that you keep in mind that participants have to be able to say no or withdraw their data and you can't try and influence them otherwise. When you're collecting data, you need to make sure that you're doing things that are ethical. I've had challenges in my interviews where participants have brought forward something that is, um, I haven't had anything that's outright alarming, but there have been things that are concerning. And it's saying, do I keep audio tapes where someone has said this? How do I keep their name separate from their interview? And how do I account for the fact that they, you know, have said something like perhaps that they're using a lot of alcohol after they're working in a clinical setting. What do I do with that? You can also think about if mistakes are made with collecting data. For example, if you're conducting a large trial and um, 
you know, a big chunk of it is missed. What are you going to do at that point? In terms of analysis, you have to have ethical analysis of your data as well. Sometimes people think, well, I need to get publications out of this. And so they'll just run analysis on every possible thing until they find something that's statistically significant and put that forward. Or they might say, I don't like the findings of this and not analyze like the last several interviews in the hopes that uh, that they'll get the results they, they want. So even at the analysis stage, you have to make sure that you're doing appropriate analysis. And also, if you're using statistical tests, that they are the right ones. Like participants have trusted you with their, their data. And if you're not using it appropriately, you're violating that trust. And finally, in terms of sharing findings, um, participants have a right to know the outcome of the study. Um, I knew of one researcher who didn't like the outcome of the study, so he didn't publish it. He, I don't know that he actively suppressed it, but he just thought, no, I don't want to publish it. I don't want to be known for this type of thing. So he just didn't do anything further. And I think that violates the trust of the participants, the funders, and all kinds of things. So you have to think about ethics as you're sharing findings and making information available as well. There's an increasing push that all publications need to be open access. I think eventually that will be mandatory because if taxpayers have funded the research, they have a right to be able to access the outputs from it. So in terms of securing ethical approval, all research that's done in healthcare must have ethical approval and you cannot start without that approval. So even if you have somebody who comes along and says, I want to tell you my story and they're like the perfect participant, you cannot interview them or you cannot give them a survey or anything until you have approval. And this can take a long time and it can be very frustrating and hold up the process. However, you have to go through with it. Otherwise, your whole project could be uh, could be shut down, which would be um, very, very negative for your career. And if you are working as a research assistant with a study, you have to check that actually the ethical approval has all been lined up. So that might be someone else's responsibility, but you still are required to make sure that those things are in place. Same as you are accountable for your practice in a clinical setting. Um, it applies here as well. So each area has specific practices about it. I would just say that if you are affiliated with a university and you're doing research at a hospital or another healthcare organization, both, org both groups have to sign off. Um, and you are responsible, make sure you ask around and you ask people who have done research in similar areas and say, have I missed anything? Is there anybody else I need clearance from? And that kind of thing. You want to make sure you know how to approach this because it can take a really long time. You also need to remember that ethical appro approvals means the research is ethical. It does not necessarily mean the research is good. So it's not a judgment of like you pass it or you fail it or it means your study's good. Um, I mean, you probably wouldn't get ethical approval for bad research, but the purpose is to determine ethics, not merit. And almost everyone is required to have revisions and um, adapt things. So if that is the case for you, don't feel that this was any kind of failure or that this is remedial. This is just how the process works, depending on the population you want to work with, the people in ethics committees have a high degree of expertise and they will um, impact things, you know, in a way that's needed for that specific population. So in terms of vulnerable, vulnerable groups, there are lots of people who uh, it's at increased risk to have them participate in research. So children, pregnant women, learning disabled, mentally ill, terminally ill, um, embryos and fetuses, foreign participants, minority communities, or people who are unconscious. Um, you could add refugees to that list. Anybody who, people who are homeless, 
anybody who is at like a social disadvantage or is unable to communicate, uh, they are going to be a high risk group. Now, this does not mean that we don't do research with them. We need to do research with children. We need to do research with pregnant women. But we have to be that much more careful knowing that they are vulnerable and that there is that much more responsibility placed on our shoulders as researchers. So you have to be very thorough, very careful, and make sure that people understand that they can stop the study and that they do not have to participate. You also need to consider someone's ability to speak back to say, um, I don't like this, I don't want to do this, and you may have to come up with different ways of uh, signaling those types of things if someone, or having the families agree if um, someone isn't able to do that themselves. You also want to consider coercion in different ways through like gatekeepers. You might have someone who um, the manager says, oh, so-and-so will participate in the study. Um, you, you leave the floor and go talk to the researcher. Well, when you, you know, get to the room that's beside the ward or whatever the case, that person might not actually want to participate, but they were sent there because their uh, manager said so. So in that instance, you might say to them, we don't need to do the study if you don't want to. We can just have a chat for 20 minutes if you prefer. But here's the information about the research. I make it very clear that if they don't want to participate, they don't have to. And you can, you know, chat about the weather for 20 minutes and then they won't lose face. And their manager won't necessarily know that they refuse to participate. So sometimes you have to be creative about these things to make sure that you're protecting your participants. In the same vein, sometimes research is sensitive but that's not necessarily a reason to avoid doing it. Um, you need to make sure that your ethics is really, your ethical principles and everything, the way you've thought about this is really robust, but you can still go forward because if you think of the type of research, like speaking to people who have, um, who are rape survivors or who have had suicide attempts, uh, people who have had addictions issues, all kinds of things. There can be lots of things that are very challenging for people, but if we are going to nurse those populations or provide care for those populations, it helps us to hear their stories directly. And it's also a way of potentially advocating for people who are vulnerable and using the credibility and the clout of being a researcher to help share their stories. So you have to do this very, very carefully, but it's not to say that it can't be done. So you want to consider anything that's really intrusive or things that might be difficult to reveal. For example, if someone is gay, but sharing that information might mean they're ostracized from their family, then you have to take seriously the risk and the confidentiality has to be top priority. You can also think about political things and how might this impact someone in their work life and their family life? What risks are they taking to participate and how can you try and mitigate those? Um, one other issue I want to uh, mention here that uh, I didn't bring in earlier was that sometimes patients can be uh, or participants rather can be paid for or rewarded for their participation in research. So you've probably seen fill out the survey and you can enter to receive a 50 pound gift card. We have to make sure that when that happens, the reward that's being offered is not disproportionate to the participation so that the, the reward is not coercive. So, for example, um, in the U.S., people are paid to donate blood. And then in turn, it turns out that sometimes people are donating blood because they are in financial duress, not because they are doing it for benevolent reasons. Now, that's not necessarily research, but perhaps there you can see that, um, that if you're doing something because you want the money from it, 
and the, the money that's provided is a significant enough amount, then that it overshadows someone's ability to provide consent, then it's a concern. So generally, if you are giving someone like quote unquote reward for the participation, it should either be commensurate with uh, their wage that they would receive. So if they come in for an hour interview, you might pay them for an hour of their time at the same rate that they would make you know, while they're working. Um, you can also, the other thing that's considered is like giving them a token. So paying for, you know, parking or transport to get there and then uh, a five dollar or a five pound card to go to a coffee shop or something like that. So that is also challenging. You need to consider how you reward people, um, but it is good to acknowledge someone's participation and that they have is an extra thing. They have gone out of their way to do that and to acknowledge that as well. Because as researchers, we completely privilege our research, yet research is often the lowest priority for people that are in clinical environments and dealing with constant fires that need to be put out and that kind of thing. So when someone makes time, you want to try and support them for that. Having said that, I did my PhD without giving any payment to participants, and I still had people who were willing to do the study. So it depends on how much funding you have and uh, the nature of what you're asking people to do. So I have a group that was designed. So for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to read the um, scenarios and you can consider those um, in light of the different principles on the screen. Um, I'm going to do this because as much as I've tried to give examples going through this presentation, this is also, there's some really key examples here and they all are things that have either happened to me personally or have happened to a research colleague of mine. So these are real life examples that are modern and very challenging as well. So when we think about first is ethics and randomized control trials. Um, I'll also try and uh, link to this handout in the description. Um, so ethics related to randomized control trials. So there's issues that you need to be particularly aware of around randomization and avoiding harm. So an example is a nurse is recruiting participants for a drug trial to treat an aggressive form of cancer. Half of the participants in the trial will receive the medication and half will receive saline. Trial is double blind, so neither the researcher nor the participant will know which group they are in. One participant that you recruit is ecstatic to participate in the trial. This new drug will save me, he says. So how do you relate this to the concepts on the screen and what would you do? I would suggest with that example that you need to return to consent and make sure the person understands um, with the idea of autonomy that they may not necessarily receive the medication. And if they do, there may not necessarily be any benefit to them. And do they still want to participate? Because you don't want to take away all of their hope that you know they may get better. That's you know, hope is a very fragile thing with people. And so you need to be mindful of that. At the same time, you need to make sure that there is informed consent. Otherwise, you can't proceed. Um, the second scenario, thinking about ethics in interviews. So key issues in interviews relate to avoiding, avoiding emotional harm, thinking about interviewer safety, and concerns about revelations of misconduct. A researcher is interviewing a nurse who works at a care home to learn more about patients being transferred to the emergency department. The purpose of this study is to identify how to support nurses in care homes to try and decrease transfers and improve patient care. In the interview, the researcher asks the nurse about a recent transfer, asking why the nurse called paramedics. The nurse responded, well, the paramedics would come with an ECG machine so we could find out if the patient's heart is beating. So what would you do in that situation? 
I think it's important to consider that as much as as a healthcare provider or or as a health researcher, as much as as much as you have an obligation to your participant in this case, there's also a significant indication that that person isn't competent to practice and um, they're at great risk to their patients. And so as much as they have a right to confidentiality, you may also say in the spirit of justice, you have to violate that right to achieve justice for those patients. Thinking about ethics with questionnaires, you want to think about the appropriateness of the questionnaires and about the burden that they're placing on participants. So an example is that a researcher is collecting data relating to a large study about young people's health. The researcher goes to a school and administers a questionnaire to the secondary students. The participants are assigned a code so that their names are not on the survey. The survey reveals that young people from one part of the city have high rates of drug use and many are involved in gang activity. It would be possible to identify who is participating in illegal activity if the codes were matched to participant names. So what would you do in that situation? And in this case, one could argue that perhaps something illegal is happening and it needs to be reported to the police. And so it would be ethical to violate the right to confidentiality because of the risk to harm. I would be inclined to say that I think you could survey just about any group of young people and you would find people engaged in some degree of illegal activity. And so maybe what is more important is learning about factors that are influencing that than reporting those students. Um, because there is potential for greater benefit if we learn more about safe factors leading people to participate in gangs than um, if a few individuals are singled out and um, potentially uh, face grave consequences for that. Finally, I have an example of ethics in observational studies. Key issues for observational studies relate to consent, being an observer, and the potential to witness harm. So our example is that a midwife is in the Democratic Republic of Congo recruiting participants for study in antenatal care. The purpose of this study is to learn about benefits to effective antenatal care and design interventions to support women. The midwife will observe local people and learn about current practices. A local contact and a gatekeeper in the village calls together all of the people and speaks to them for several minutes in French. At the end, the contact turns to the midwife who does not speak French and says everyone agrees to participate. So what would you do? So this is a challenging situation because not only are you concerned about the consent and that people who may or may not fully understand the study, I am also worried a little further back about why someone is doing this research in an area where they don't speak the language. And that's not to say that you always must speak the language with everyone you work with, but you shouldn't be relying on local gatekeepers for the translation. There should be someone on the research team who can do the translation so you know that consent is informed. Additionally, you would want to approach people individually and privately and see if they do actually want to consent. And if they don't, this again might be a case where maybe you just sit on their porch and, and you don't collect any data, but you're just there to help save face or to disguise the fact that they're not participating or any number of things. So there's a lot of ways there that you would have to be really careful. So hopefully those examples have helped explain how these different principles may be considered with different issues and the ethics can be really messy. It's not necessarily straightforward. And for researchers, these things are really hard. And that's why it's important to have good advisors and a team that you can talk to to make sure that you are protecting participants every step of the way.
So in summary, research must be guided by ethical principles because if we want our clinical practice to be ethical, our research informing that practice must be ethical too. In order to evaluate research evidence, we have to assess ethical conduct as well as the findings. You know, just because it's potential Nobel Prize doesn't mean that it's automatically gets a buy on ethical um, qualities as well. That must be assessed first and foremost. And additionally, researchers must obtain ethical approval for their research and consider, consider ethical issues at every stage. So here are the references that were used in developing this lecture.